listening to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, where women who are ready to expand their life adventure discover the tools to stop playing small and tap into the courage required to enjoy their Second Wind. Welcome. Welcome today to today's show. It's kind of an overcast day where I am, but I hope the sun is out, it's shiny wherever you are, and it's a beautiful day. You know, even overcast is not bad. It's kind of comforting, warming, welcoming. I have a word for you this morning. It's called adaptability. Adaptability. And I thought, as I was thinking about that word, and I certainly do use this word because of our guest today, she has just been so adaptable in her life. I love listening to her story because she kept adapting through her life. Adaptability is saying that you can adjust to whatever there is when life presents a turn in the road or a change in your job, or something that changed the direction you're going in. And she will share with us how she has adapted herself. It's not really a a skill that we're born with, but it is a skill that we can learn. And certainly, the more that things like attitude can involve that, our ability to analyze the present situations and make pivots or changes in our life is very important. So one of the, so this week, I want you to kind of reflect, are you adaptable? Certainly this pandemic has been easier for some people than others. Because of their ability to adapt to the situation. Because we've all been in stressful situations. And so it's many times made isolation, um, uh, family, being with our family all the time. Um, all of those situations, we've had to adapt to them. Because seldom do we spend 24-7 with our loved ones day after day after day after day. So, And I hear there, there's an increase in divorces <laughs> because of that. But hopefully, with the peace and with the life returning to its new normal, which we have yet to see what that is, there'll be some marriages saved once they realize it's getting adaptable to the situation that is affected their relationship. So anyway, I welcome you today and I'm, I'm most eager to get in and share my guest with you because she just is amazing woman. And I love that she has been so adaptable. Ann Walsh is an art therapist, author, speaker, and mother of two adorable girls. She graduated in studies in art therapy, wanting to connect more deeply with people who struggle to communicate. She's worked with older adults diagnosed with dementia, living in long-term care. She's worked with nurses requesting burnout prevention workshops due to their heavy schedules of working. She has taught 12 years at Algonquin College, where she taught psychology, leadership, and react recreation for older adult classes. After being a, becoming a mother, she has incorporated a barn on the family property located in Kemptonville, Kemptville, Ontario, Canada, as her studio to practice art therapy and hold classes. She has turned more toward the family supporting children and mothers with their life issues. So I know you want to listen to those. Now, COVID caused another pivot in creating online art therapy sessions, creative journaling groups, ghostwriting services she provides, and hopefully returning to speaking circles again. It is through her encouragement of self-expression 
and self-exploration. She has found herself and her clients fulfilled in today's world. Welcome, Miss Ann. Thank you so much, Joyce. I am, I'll, I'll tell you, I feel really honored to be here because I was listening to your podcast interviews just to get a feel for your style. And I, I was blown away by the caliber of the women that you've interviewed and uh, the conversations that you've had. I was just getting so excited uh, for our conversation today. So thank you for including me. Oh, you are, I, you are a case we all need to study. I think it's really hard to be adaptable to the situations. Some people do it better than others, but I think you have done it beautifully. Well, some of the situations, and I, I'm calling you adaptable queen, the adaptable queen here, <laughs> if you don't mind, no. because you've done it so beautifully in your transitions from one field to another. But you always kept your art therapy uh, present. That was your was that your your primary love in working with individuals. I love connecting with people. That's ah. the thing. I love stories. I love connecting with people, and I find the art therapy allows me to do that. It allows me to go deep. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the torture for me is networking events. I hate small talk, and when you have to go into a room of strangers. And kind of, you know, sip your wine and uh, hold your crackers and cheese and try to make light conversation. Yes. That is a nightmare for me. So when I can sit and really dig and get into the messiness and really explore how people are doing and how they're really feeling, uh-huh. that is that is my pure joy. Yes, I think a lot of us join you in the networking struggles. It's stressful. You know, we go, do I really have to do this? (laughs) But but you were, you stayed for 12 years with the Algonquin, am I saying that correctly? College. Uh, and that was teaching psychology, leadership and recreation. So yeah. you again return to working with older adults uh, in yeah. their struggles. Yeah, I did. So um, when I started to be an art, an art therapist, the reason I wanted to be an art therapist was because um, I'm not a very patient person. And when you do verbal therapy, it could take a long time to kind of tease out the actual issues that you need to work on. Uh-huh. And I do not have the patience to do that. And so... Um, I wanted to get to the, to the core mm-hmm. and art allows you to do that because I can sit with people and they, they will tell me their story, but then their art never lies. The art tells you exactly where they are and then you can really have an honest conversation and yeah. look at them and see what's coming up. And so I was working as an art therapist in long-term care with people with dementia Mm-hmm. And in that case, it's lovely because a lot of them are non nonverbal or they're not able to communicate easily. Mm-hmm. And so I could use art projects to help them connect with staff so that they saw them as an individual with a whole life history and with their family who had to adjust to seeing them in a new way. This was not the person that they knew, but um, through the art, they could show them that they were still in there. And I loved my work, but when budget cuts came along, uh, I needed to figure out where I was going to work next. And I right. knew nurses were about to be uh, cut. And so as an art therapist, if they're going to be cutting nurses, you're sure you're not going to be there. You're not going to be in the budget. Yes. And um, it just so happened that the administrator of the home had been going home and telling her husband about all the work that I was doing. Mm-hmm. And he he was the coordinator of the recreation program. It was called Recreation and Leisure Services, and then there was a uh, facility management program at Algonquin College. So mm-hmm. he reached out to me, and we had lunch, and he asked me if I could do something about their recreation for older adults class because I was mm-hmm. passionate in it, uh, about my work with older adults. And he mm-hmm. said, none of the students want to take this optional course, and we have this huge baby boomer population that is aging and they are going to need services. So we need to get our students interested in working with them. Ah. 
would you be able to make this course something that maybe more people would sign up for? Mm-hmm. And so we were at this restaurant with paper menus. <laughs> and I flipped it over and I said, well, how many weeks, how many hours? And I started to jot down some ideas. And I wrote down what I would teach in a 16-week course. Oh. And um, he said, you're hired. And so I started teaching part-time at first while I was still working uh, in long-term care. Mm -hmm. And it grew from there. I got, uh, after I taught the first semester, he said, okay, now do a part two. And I was like, part two? If you told me there was going to be a part two, I wouldn't have put everything in part (laughs) one. I get that. (laughs) <laughs> it took a few years to get it kind of figured out, but uh-huh. um, I was grateful for the opportunity and I loved teaching. It was, it was so much fun to get to know the students and figure out where they needed to be. And, and eventually I was doing field placement management so I could put them in the right place. And uh, uh-huh. it was amazing. I loved it. It was a great opportunity. Now, when we say art therapy, can you give us a better description? I mean, what does that involve? Right. So generally people are familiar with verbal therapy where you go and the person says what brings you in and then you describe and then you talk back and forth. They ask questions and they get you to think about what's going on and look at it from different perspectives. Yes. And so when you're doing art therapy, you have access to art tools that you can use to express yourself. And so one of my most popular workshops is a corporate workshop, uh, well, for adults anyways, is a corporate resilience workshop. And one of the questions I ask at the very beginning, because a lot of people say, oh, there's an art therapist coming, here we go, and she's going to make us draw, we're going back to kindergarten, right? And a lot of times there's resistance because people have this concept, and so did I, that you are either an artist or you're not. Yes. And so if you're not an artist, don't humiliate yourself by trying to create. Mm-hmm. And so one of the activities that I start off with is I ask people to draw themselves standing in the rain. And and they have to draw themselves standing in the rain. And some people do a really quick sketch and flip over their sheet. And other people take a really long time and put lots of details. And that's just different ways of being creative. Yeah. People like to put down one idea and really develop it. And others just jot down a whole bunch of ideas and leave it at that. And so then we start to look at this. What is it communicating to you? And people are always shocked by what they see in their art. It's actually an assessment of your resilience. And so Uh to say, look at this element, this is what it means. Look at that element. And then they look at their art and they can see the parallels between what's coming up in the art and what they're actually experiencing in real life. Mm -hmm. That's when the buy-in happens. That's when people go, okay, there's something to this. Uh So people come and see an art therapist. You can sit and talk. Mm -hmm. You can get art directives where I say, okay, well, Why don't you draw, like one of the things I do with women who are stuck is I'll say, draw yourself in a landscape. Show me where you are right now. If you were, if your life situation were a landscape, what would that look like? And so maybe they'll draw themselves at the edge of a cliff. Maybe Mm. they'll draw themselves in deep, deep woods in the dark and all the trees are, you know, the leaves are over them. Or they'll draw themselves running through a field of flowers or and whatever they're drawing. That's the first image that came to their mind. Mm -hmm. And when we reflect on it, we'll start to understand the parallels. And it it's a way of people talking to themselves. They communicate with themselves through their art because it's still them creating the art. It's just a a deeper, wiser part of yourself that you're not aware of most of the time. And so the use of the art is it's a tool not just to talk about what's going on, but to see at the core, what is the core issue that's happening? Um, And I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I keep doing the same thing over and over again. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. The art will bring that up. So they'll say, this is my pattern. Okay, let's draw it as a comic strip. Show me your pattern. First frame, second frame, third frame, fourth frame, all of the different frames. And then let's cut them so that they're not connected and see, is there a frame we can remove? Is there, can we change the order in which they happen? What would happen if this happened after this? And we kind of play around with it. So it's, 
It's something concrete that you can do to mm-hmm. take action. And it's why I love it because mm-hmm. people are actively involved in their session. They're not just talking and then leaving feeling good because they talk, but still going back to the same situation. They get clear and then they can take action. Yeah. Uh, if I want to, I want to sign up, Pan. <laughs> I think, that, I mean, do you, after they do their, their first picture or whatever, I mean, okay, do you get, when somebody just quickly doesn't flips it over, do you get an idea of the personality or do you take anything from that? Uh, uh, not too interested versus one that's very intense. Do you make decisions like that or do you just let it pass? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what you mean. And so everybody's going to have a different approach based yeah. on how nervous they are, right? Uh, how willing they are to be vulnerable and open. Uh, uh-huh. If I went to a corporate setting where there's a really good relationship I feel it immediately in how open people are and how eager they are to to get started and to share what they've created. If I go into an environment where there's obviously some conflict mm-hmm. and people are not feeling safe, they're not going to put as much detail. They're going to keep their drawing to themselves. They're not going to want to share it, which I don't force people to share their drawings because it's really about them connecting with what they drew and what that means for them. It's not about anybody else. It's none of their business, what's going right. on with the person. Um, so I definitely feel a difference um, individually, like how open they are to doing the art and to doing the digging. And as a group, whether they feel safe in that group or not. Mm. And there's a, danger, there's a danger in interpreting. Some people will, uh, you do some art and then they interpret it. And there's a danger in there. Because I'm a human being and I might see something in the art because of my own filters. I yeah. will hone in on something that's more about me than them. Uh, so I spend more time giving directives that I think will help open the person up or see things, see a new venue or a new option. And then... I listen to what they have to say about it. What did it bring up for them? There's often a release of emotion because it's coming from deep. And so yeah. sometimes they come in, stiff upper lip, and then they start to do the art, and then the tears start to come out. And the, the interesting thing is women always say, I'm sorry. When they start to cry, they go, oh, I'm sorry. And I think, I know. If, if you're you so right. At your therapist, where are you going to cry? Let it out. Let that out. <laughs> Uh, but they, that instinct is always, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh huh. Why do we apologize when we cry? I don't and know. I, I use that myself. I will sometimes, in yeah. an unexpected cry, I'll apologize. As yeah. though it is something we shouldn't express. Yes. Uh, do you allow your people, once they've done a, a picture, a portrait, or a piece of art, do you then encourage them to write about it? Because I know you use writing a lot with your work. I started doing that. Uh, I've always journaled. I mean, I, I started journaling, I think I was 12. And I have wow. lots and lots of journals. <laughs> Some of them, I look back and it's pretty funny. You know, I have a crush on this guy or whatever. <laughs> if you look at early days. <laughs> but uh, I've always journaled. And uh-huh. one thing I noticed um, when I went through some challenging periods of my life, I stopped drawing. I just wrote. And that was an, it, it wasn't really a conscious switch. I just, it was like, oh, I don't have time. So I'm just going to draw. I'm just going to write and document what's going on. I don't have time to draw. Yeah. And I realized afterwards when I went back to creative journaling that that was a way to stay in my head. That was a way of staying safe because I felt um, overwhelmed and I didn't want to, again, with the stiff upper lip, mm-hmm. I don't want to lose it. So I'm just going to write and that keeps me safe. I can still document, but I'm in my head. And as soon as I went back to adding the art part to the uh-huh. drawing, there was an emotional release. There was connection. And I immediately knew, um, why I do this work. I was like, of course, why, why did I stop drawing? Why did I stop adding collages and drawings and paintings to my journaling? And so, um, 
some people like to dr- to write. Some people like to draw. Other people might like to paint, do collage, uh, build stuff with materials that I have. It really depends on what they're going through. Mm-hmm. Um, I've worked with women who were sexually abused and they were doing some healing. And one of the first things I did with them was create bowls out of uh, clay. Oh, and The clay is uh, a very good medium when you need to release some tension, when you need to get grounded because you're talking about things that are very difficult and can cause some dissociation. And so the, the clay, the earthiness of the clay and being able to pound the clay and make it softer and feel the resistance of the clay and then turn it into something which was a bowl that they could then use in some of the activities where I have, I was having them fill that bowl with self care cues. Mm-hmm. So things that they could do when they were not taking care of themselves, they could go back and pick something from the bowl and do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah. So you use several different mediums. When we're talking about art therapy, you're using pottery and paint. And drawing and collage. Uh Whatever whatever appeals to that person and what they're going through Uh um, will go. And sometimes I'll go and buy a material because I think, you know what? I bet you this person, like one of the ladies that I worked with, um, I went and bought foam board so that she could cut out. She was trying to do a vision board. It wasn't working for her. She wanted something 3D. And so uh, we carved something significant to her. We drew it, and then she carved it out and painted it and put it where she had like a like a little area that she would go to every morning while she was getting ready for work. She, it was visible. It was there and it was a reminder every day. So for her foam board was important and that's where we, we went. Oh, it could be anything. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love to do vision boards. Yes. Um, there's such a good way for people to, I think. Now, do you, you use them in, in, getting focused on what they want in the future or do you, how do you use your boards? Yes. Well, if they're in a transition, yes. Um, once we examine the stories about their transition, because they're always stories, what this means. And so uh-huh. if they're, if they're ill, it might be, you know, Oh, Oh, well I smoked for five years and that's why it's my punishment for, for smoking. That's why I'm ill now and I'm going to die. And, and it's like, yeah. okay, let's reframe that. Let's look at that <laughs> story. Right. Or they, they, um, uh, well, I don't want to use any examples from real people, but they're, whatever their story is, we, we, look at that story and what that means and how we can reframe it in a more positive way. And sometimes having a vision board allows them to visualize it, how that would feel, how that would look if, if their story was the new way, the way that they've recreated and reframed it. And so it's a good tool. It's a good reminder for them, whether it's they want to meet another man or they want to travel or they want to be closer to their children, mm-hmm. whatever they're working on. They put that on the board and there's an emotional quality that comes from these visual representations and it keeps them focused whenever they start to go back to the old story that they're not worthy or that, right. you know, their punishment, then they go back to the board and get focused. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't understand why you you ask the woman to use core board versus a poster board, which is what we normally use. Why was that? Why did that make a difference for her doing the vision board? Well, it wasn't really a vision board. It was a a, oh. a visual prompt, and oh, okay. she needed something three dimensional. She needed something that would stand on her shelf. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so she was looking for, for some depth, something thick. And she did not have the confidence at that time to be working through wood. Yeah, otherwise, yes. just use wood and created it through wood. Ooh, she yeah. she did not have the confidence at that point. And so um, we did the foam board because it was thick. It was light. She could, mm-hmm. she could move it around. She could put it on her shelf. And it wasn't going to fall over the way a piece of paper or... or right. Uh, cardboard wood. Yeah. 
So when you were beginning to be, it's obviously one that you're very excited. You love what you're doing. Uh, It's very, it's wonderful to hear. Very, and it's just really very nice to hear. Uh, But I'm curious, how were you drawn? Were you drawn to the art? Or were you drawn to the the therapy of? I had studied um, psychology. I did my BA in psychology at Ottawa U, okay. uh, Ottawa University. Mm-hmm. And then um, I, in my last year, I was able to do some verbal therapy. Um, so I, I would have a client once a week, and it was part of our training for graduation. And that's where I realized that I wanted something more interactive. Um, oh. And I wanted to see change. I, I know change happens over time, but I, I really wasn't seeing that much change over the semester that I was working with them. Yes. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. And then I heard about a program in Montreal. The University of Montreal had a program called uh, Mental Health Promotion. And I thought, maybe it's an intervention. I need to do promotion. And Uh so I went to the University of Montreal, and I did the promotion program. It was a graduate one-year program. Uh And you had to pick some optional classes, and there was a creativity program. And I thought, creativity? How is that a program? So I took all (laughs) of my optional courses in that that program, Uh and I loved it. And I thought, I'm studying mental health promotion in the one program. But I am learning so much more about myself in this Mm. other program on creativity. Mm. And that kind of sparked my interest in doing something with creativity. And the thing is, I was never an artist. I was always very creative. I loved to write. I had Mm. done some dance. I had done a lot of theater. But I was not a visual artist. And so when when I was looking at what are my options, how can I incorporate this into my work I um I found art therapy there was play therapy and art therapy and I thought well play therapy limits me pretty much to working with children because there's not a lot of adults going for play therapy um (laughs) although they need it (laughs) they do yes they do (laughs) do. Uh, so I thought well can I do art therapy I mean I'm not I'm not an artist so how does that work And I looked into it, and there were two streams. One stream was for artists becoming therapists, and the other stream was for therapists incorporating art. Mm -hmm. And um, so I took that second stream. I still had to do a year of art and and submit a portfolio, and that was a really fun experience. We will be back with you shortly, so don't go away. Transformational coach, motivational speaker, and author Joyce Buford returns after this short break. Close your eyes and imagine living your life without limits. Where would you go? Who would you meet? What would you do? During an Uncover Your Hidden Genius session, you will discover what's keeping you from living your life with purpose, passion, and fulfillment of your potential. You'll get a clear vision of the steps you need to take to uncover your hidden genius so that you can live a life without limits. Sessions can be done over the phone, Skype, or in person. Find out more at www.JoyceBufordEmpowers.com or by calling 903-287-0747. According to state troopers, here's what not to do when you get pulled over. Don't be a lachrymist and start crying right away. It doesn't help. But if you're under 20, crying won't be held against you. Don't ask for a break. and Don't yell or start any argy-bargy. And one trooper said, if they're going to flirt with me to get out of a ticket, it would probably insult my intelligence. But unfortunately, I don't get hit on all that often. So flirting or being a gill flirt won't work. Did you know that 15% of all drivers get 76% of all traffic tickets? And the odds of winning if you challenge a traffic ticket in court are 1 in 3. So what should you do when you get pulled over for speeding? Be courteous to the officer and most of all, be honest. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. Back to this segment of Second Wind, Joyce Buford 
The author of Effortless Happiness continues in this segment to share insights that will help you live a life of greater purpose and filled with happiness. Now here's our host, author and coach, Joyce Buford. Now welcome back. We are visiting today with Ann Walsh. Now she is a art therapist and she's been sharing all of this fantastic information about how the two really can progress art and her therapy work can work together to take a person deeper into sharing what they are really there for when they're speaking and spending time together. So, and you, you had just, um, uh, started talking about how you started putting the art together. You got the course that allowed you to do that. Yes. Yes. So I, I had studied, um, mental health promotion and creativity courses and, found that a way to combine them mm-hmm. was through art therapy. And then I went through the program to develop my art skills because I I really didn't come to this work as an artist. And I actually had a lot of doubts, self-doubts at first, because I thought, well, who am I to be doing art therapy? Like these people, a lot of people who came to me were already creative and artists. And I yeah. thought, I felt like a fraud. Like I can't help these people. I'm not an artist. They want, you know, I expected... I had these expectations of myself, like I should be really good at all these different mediums. And in the end, it was my greatest gift because a lot of people come to me who are not artists and they think they have to be good artists in order to get value from the therapy. And I can say to them, honestly, I gain so much from doing this work and I am not an artist. I am a therapist and I use art. It is one more tool to help me communicate and connect with you. And I encourage you to create the art. It does not have to look good. And, um, you will, you will still get the communication, whether it's a stick figure or a well-rounded detailed figure, Mm -hmm. it will communicate to you. Don't worry about the details. Ah, I just think that's fascinating that those two can work complement each other and, yes. and and share so much information. Now we've I, we have talked a lot about the art therapy, which I I'm excited about your enthusiasm and you're going to offer something and share with my audience about that you have coming up in the future. So what is that? You want to share that now? Sure. Um, So one of the things, my biggest transition, the -hmm. biggest transition that I've been through was becoming a mom. And I became, before I was a mom, I was super focused on my career because I I was raised by a single mom and we didn't have a lot of money. Uh And I thought, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to be financially stable. I am not going to be poor when I grow Mm -hmm. up. And I was very uh, focused on my career. And then uh, by the time I had my daughter, I was 35 years old. Mm-hmm. I um, was a full-time professor at the college. I was married, and I owned my own house on an acre of land. So I thought, this is great. This is exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then I had my child, and I suddenly didn't want to work anymore. I just didn't want to do it. Oh. And It wasn't that I didn't want to work. It's that I didn't want to be away from my daughter. Mm -hmm. And so I prayed and cried and bought lottery tickets, hoping (laughs) that I could somehow stay home. And it didn't work out. Um, And on my first day back, I actually, it was a three-hour leadership course. And one hour in, I said to the students, I will be right back. And I ran to the washroom and threw up. And (gasps) all of the stress from, like, Um, anticipating my first day. So of course the rumor was that I was pregnant because it was morning. It was eight in the morning and I was throwing up or nine by then, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that was the amount of stress. And, wow. um, so I, I ended up later on, I got pregnant again and went on a second mat leave with my other daughter. And I thought, this is great. And we moved out to the country, which was amazing because we had a bigger house so we could accommodate the new, my new, uh, my eldest, my youngest daughter. And so, Mm We could be in, the, in nature and everything, but three things happened after that. So, uh, first was I was isolated because I didn't know anybody here and my yes. husband was building his business where we lived. So he was very busy with work mm-hmm. and my mom, who I'm, who I'm very close to lived in Ottawa, which is 45 minutes away and she doesn't have a car. So I kept having to drive. Oh, back. 
grew up. So I was very isolated. My eldest hated the new baby. So oh. she was not happy. She was very angry with us for having her. Mm-hmm. And she was not adapting to her little sister. Mm-hmm. And the third thing that happened was my husband was diagnosed with PTSD shortly after we had our second daughter. Yeah. So he was in his own kind of world trying to figure out what he was going to do. And I just want to mention that a lot of men uh, who've had trauma in their childhood go through PTSD after the birth. It's a trigger. Oh. And... And there is such a thing as male PTSD. So we, uh, male, uh, postpartum depression. We often focus on the women, but men also, um, some men have, uh, postpartum. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to share that because I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. And so the reason I'm sharing this is because when I was going through all of this, all of these changes, I took the art out of my journaling. And it was only when I brought it back that I felt like I found myself again. I felt like me and I felt clear instead of feeling stuck. And I felt like I could stand up for myself and my, my boundaries and make decisions and speak up. Uh And so one of the things that I'm doing now with COVID, I've had to pivot my business and kind of offer stuff online Mm-hmm. So I started doing creative journaling because it's something people can do from home. I don't have to ship uh, materials or expect yes. people to go out and buy some when they just they're they're not working because of this pandemic or whatever. So uh-huh. it's mm-hmm. easy to do the creative journaling because all you need is some kind of piece of paper, something that you can express yourself on yes. and whatever materials you have, pencils, markers, pens, paints, if you have whatever materials you have, but at the very least a napkin and eyeliner. I mean, anything, <laughs> right? Um, yes. So I like that it's accessible And I also found, um, I just turned 50 in July. And as I got through my 40s and towards 50, a lot of the people around me, the women around me, were telling me that they were at a crossroads. They they had just gotten divorced. Their kids had just left the house and they were all of a sudden not knowing what to do with their life. Mm -hmm. Um, And or they were ill. All of a sudden, all of the stress, everything that they had put off mm-hmm. is now affecting their body and they were scared. Mm-hmm. And so all of these different, or they'd lost their job with COVID. A lot of people, that's how. Yes, right. So we were having all these conversations about how scared they were, how stuck they were, how they didn't even know. Like some women, they'll get divorced and they tell me, I don't even know what I want for breakfast. I always made eggs for my husband and mm-hmm. I don't like eggs but I don't know what I want instead. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this is the perfect time to do creative journaling because for me, it's easier as an art therapist because I can do that online. Everybody's got a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil or whatever. And I know personally that I came home to myself through creative journaling and Uh I want that for everybody else. Those people who are stuck and who feel so confused and who are unable to take action because they just don't even know where to start. The creative journaling, we start very gently, but it's a, it's a program. It's 12 weeks. It's online. And basically once a week, it, I've made it, I've scheduled it Sunday at 11, but that's Eastern time. So I guess it would be 10 central time. Yeah. Uh, so people log on, they click the link and then We have a chit chat. I give them some kind of art prompt Mm -hmm. and writing prompt. And then they do their thing. And then we share as a group what came up and and, um, what they've discovered. And they can keep communicating with each other. If they connect with somebody in the group, they can keep communicating throughout the week. But I'm there once a week Mm -hmm. and give you a new assignment. And we do it for 12 weeks. And I love it because... One, the whole thing about not being an artist, you're at home. You don't have to share it with anybody. It's not like when you're in my group setting and people can see over your arm, they're looking at your art yeah. and, you know, they notice what you drew or whatever. You're, you're at home. You're in the privacy of your own home. Right. It's in a journal. So if you want to hide it, um, in, in the case of people who are in relationships where they do not feel safe, mm-hmm. they can 
create and then they can go and, and hide it somewhere and keep it safe. Yeah. Uh, they're able to c- connect with other women and hear from other women what is going on with them and understand that they're not alone. Like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only person. Oh, that's and so good. It gives yeah. them strength and it, it right. normalizes their situation so that they're not thinking there's something wrong with them. Right. That's so good. Yeah. I, I, um, I wonder if I could share a story with you here yes. of yes. the person that doesn't think she can write. Mm. Um, that would be me because yes. I, um, uh, I have to do some writing in my business, but I don't, I've never featured myself as a writer. Yes. Okay. I don't put that on my, my, uh, bio. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, I was asked to write an article for the local magazine. And um I haven't been asked to do that before. And I wanted the the carrot, which was to be in a local magazine, yes. so badly that I totally <laughs> said yes without letting the fear get back in my brain. You know how that happens. Yes. And so anyway... It was about the angels and COVID and how we've responded in our community. And, and it was so, it was such a positive experience for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if it was because of the subject matter, angels, but there was so many downloads in that experience for me. I mean, I researched and I got a download. I wrote and I got a download and it was just an, an amazing experience. And I even finished it early and mailed it in a week early. Now imagine if you had held back because of your fear and you would never have that experience. I know. Mm. Well, the magazine's coming out next month. So oh, good. in November. So, okay. but it, it, my share there is one to say that we all have something inside of us that pulls can be pulled out whether you know it was the angel that was helping me or it was my inner knowing that was helping me it was the research but we i mean if we don't let the fear get in our way it's amazing what we could do yes yes isn't it but one of the things i found um my very first group that i had after i built the studio or i didn't build it but after i had the studio built on my property mm-hmm. uh my very first group was divorce divas and so uh, some women were asking do you do anything for women after divorce and it came up quite a bit so i thought okay all the people who asked me i'm going to put them in a group and that's what we're going to do and so um i started the divorce diva group and what i what i learned from it is that uh, women don't see their strength. They see everyone mm-hmm. else's strength. And so everybody would say, oh, well, you're, you went through that. I don't even know. I wouldn't have been able to, but mm-hmm. I only went through this. And then they would say the same thing about them. Oh, are you kidding me? You're way stronger. <laughs> like, like, stop. You are yeah. all strong, resilient women. Stop putting yourselves down. Like, yes. He, you're here, you've survived. Uh And so I learned that women don't see their own strengths. They see everybody else's. And I saw this need to be witnessed, to connect and to own it. You know, yes, I've been through that and, and to share it with other people. And I think it's sad if we don't recognize that we have a purpose, that our experience will impact other people and we, we, we play small, like you said. You don't want to do that because you're robbing other people of your experience. They need to hear your story. They need whatever artwork you're going to present and put up or article you're going to write. So yeah. you need to let that flow through you. Yes. And even talking about it frees us from our own um, limitations, you know, yes. allowing ourselves to give yes. uh, really enriches it. And we find out it was a gift, not yes. a, a, um, mm, awful. We're not a victim. We are a victory. We are a victor. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Forward. You yeah. like that? I do. I like that. <laughs> um, 
I want to talk about something else, another thing that you are gifted with, Anne, and that is your own writing, but you have shared that in children's books, which I think is awesome. Yes, I started off um, writing children's books, and it was quite by accident because my, my training is not in writing. Actually, mm-hmm. English is my second language, <laughs> so it, it, it never dawned on me that I'd be writing books. But mm-hmm. my eldest daughter in grade one was being bullied, and I was watching her disappear into herself, um, and it really hurt my heart to see that. And um, I spoke to the teacher and I wrote notes in her agenda and I did all the stuff you do when your kid is struggling in school and it was just getting worse. And I was watching her behavior change and her becoming, you know, having the self doubts and yeah. kind of getting all closed off physically. And, and it was making me angry because I thought, Oh, what am I going to do? I can't just let her, you know, get this experience, go through this over and over again every day. So I designed some workshops And I started to go into elementary schools and teach stuff like how to make a friend, you know, all these pro-social behaviors, stress. Yeah. How to manage stress, how to manage your your strong emotions like anger and frustration. And uh, I talked about resilience and boundaries and all sorts of different topics. And one of the topics was about anger management. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a book that I could use because I always read a book, we would do some art and I would talk to the students about whatever the topic was. Yeah. And, um, I, there wasn't a book that I, I liked. A lot of books were, were fun, but the message was how to not be angry. And I thought that's not possible. You're going to get angry. Sometimes you're a human being and anger is not bad. You need anger in your life like there are times where people push your your boundaries and without anger you just get abused so mm-hmm. um you need to be able to express that in a constructive way and so i wrote my own book which was called uh have you hugged your alien i love it it was all about how we have this alien within us and that sometimes the alien comes out and, and takes a bigger form and takes over mm-hmm. and uh, some of the stuff that the alien does, and then we get in trouble for it. And so in my workshops, and my workshop notes are actually in my on my website for teachers to download or parents or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, I talk about this alien part and asking, stopping and asking yourself what your alien needs. And um, depending on where you are, how can you use movement, breath, and your voice to help yourself make better decisions? And... Uh. I teach the children that when they have an angry response or a frustrated response, it's their, it's their fight and flight response. And it takes about 90 seconds for the adrenaline to kind of calm down. Mm-hmm. And so if you can do something in that 90 seconds until it's passed, you will make better decisions because then your your smart brain comes back yeah. on. And you're able to think, whereas before your primitive brain has taken over and you, no matter what anybody says, it's not going to get through and you're going to make a poor choice and you'll get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a whole workshop that goes with it. But that's why I actually wrote that book. It was just meant to be something I used in my workshop and I didn't expect it to take off. Uh, but it did. It had a life of its own and I ended up on TV talking about it. And then oh, I ended up. Yes a bunch of workshops and articles and all this kind of stuff. So um, it was a lot of fun. And then I wrote the second book about my daughter's reaction to my second daughter. Uh, and that oh, yeah. was called <laughs> The Story of Pooh Bum and Pom Pom. <laughs> because uh, it was the story, it was through through animals. So I was talking about how this dog has this amazing life. And then the owners decide to get this fluffy little kitten and Eric loves the kitten and he feels excluded and replaced. And so it's the whole dynamics, but through animals. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would have been a good book for me to have when I had my second so that I could have read it to my eldest and she could have felt seen and heard. Oh yes. Um, A valuable tool. 
Yeah, and I do workshops with that as well, but I normally do it through the library or after school, and we build a little box together, and families fill the box with stuff that they can do together, really small things that the child wants to do with the parent when whenever they have a break. So when the baby's sleeping, maybe we're making cookies or, you know, whatever's in the box. You pick something out, and you can do it to to have that connection and to give the child a feeling of control because they wrote the stuff that's in the box. Like they told uh-huh. they wanted. Uh-huh. And, um, and I find it interesting because it's so simple. It's like, I want to make pancakes and we're, you know, buying tickets to a concert and we're doing be- big things thinking we need to, to show them how much we love them. But really they just want to read a book or in our lap or make pancakes mm-hmm. on Saturday mm-hmm. morning, you know, simple things. Time, time. Well, I, I think you need to do, and uh, I think you need to do those online. There are so many moms that deal with the bullying. Yes. And what a beautiful way you've done that. And of course, the second child, I that has to be a big one, just to, just as big. Um, yes. Oh yes, I'm I'm a big fan, and <laughs> we need those much. online. I know you do awesome with those Thank because they are such needs. Now you do support moms through a blog on your website as well, don't you? Well, I've, um, oh, after yeah. doing a few years of, uh, workshops with children, mm-hmm. I started to get grants to go after school and do work with families. Mm-hmm. And in that work, I was talking to some moms and I started to do, workshops just for moms and individual work with moms. So I started to have more mothers coming to me for individual work. Yes. And yeah. I recognized the need to write a book, which I did. It's called Out of the Mouths of Moms. <laughs> and yes. uh, I wrote that book because I felt like moms needed to hear each other's stories. I would have maybe four moms in one day doing individual sessions, each telling me uh, a, a slightly different version of the other mom story. Yes. And I was, wouldn't it be amazing if they all talked together, if they all heard each other's stories, because each mom was determined to see herself as the only person that was going through this mm-hmm. situation. I'd be like, no, you are not alone. Other moms feel this way too. Mm-hmm. And if I put them in a group together, they wouldn't talk about the deep stuff that we talk about individually. They would, you know, talk about sleep deprivation, like the, the safe stuff, right? They would yes. Yes. keep the topics, you know, their husbands, whether they were helping or not, mm-hmm. uh, the school, sleep, weight gain, safe topics, but they weren't deep into their self doubts and insecurities and uh, resentments and hurts. And so I thought I need, I need to have a book where they can, any mom can pick it up and see somebody who, that she resonates with that, that frees her to feel like I am not alone. This is normal. And I can open up and talk about it with other moms. Mm -hmm. And so I inter, I spent a year interviewing moms and I have oh. this book that has 50 stories of motherhood in it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I didn't select, like I just said, whoever wants to be in it. And then some moms decided to be in the book and other moms went through the process and felt like they weren't ready to share it. And that was yeah. fun. So I ended up with 50 stories, but they're very diverse. And, um, it opened my eyes to the need for support for moms. Mm-hmm. And so when my book was, um, started selling, I used the proceeds, all of the proceeds from my book to, um, survey moms in my area and find out what the needs were. And mm-hmm. the biggest needs yeah. for support were from newly divorced moms who wanted to be able to connect with other moms mm-hmm. and mothers of children on the spectrum who have nothing to do all summer. Like they are with their kids because they don't fit into any of the summer programs right. and school is out. Yeah. So they are on 24 seven all summer yeah. and it's, I can't even imagine how exhausting that is. <laughs> and yeah. so I connected the moms, the divorced moms through a Facebook page called flying solo. And then I uh, funded a summer program where Local teenagers were trained and they were paired with a family 
and they awesome. they were together six hours a week, giving them yeah. some respite. Oh, you you are just you are a fountain of riches here for so many mothers that feel that isolation, and, and with COVID, I'd feel, I'm sure they feel it even more so if that's possible. Yeah. But so that we're we're coming to. the end of our hour and I want them to know how they can get in touch with you. You also have a free offer for them. So could you tell us about that? Yes, of course. And so my, my website is www.annewalsh.ca because I am in Canada. <laughs> and um, so on there, you're going to see information about my creative journaling one-on-one or in groups yeah. and the ghost writing for people who want to write their book and the uh, speaker support for people who want to share their story Right. So, okay. So moving on, the offer that you want to give, because we're just about out of time, man. Yeah. So anybody who wants to get in touch with me, uh, they can reach out to me and let me know that they heard uh, my story on Joyce Buford uh-huh. and that they would like to get started. And we can spend 30 minutes for free doing an initial consultation. Awesome. Yes. What a great offer. Well, I, I just can't tell you how, how excited I am about all the work that you've done, how you have just kept adapting again, my favorite word today. Um, but it's led you to such important, significant work where you're working with women and families and children today yes. in an area that they desperately need so that they know they're not alone. You know, yes. it's pretty common, as you say how we interact. So thank you for being here. Thank you so, so much for having me. Yes. So I, I want to share with my listener, you, that yes. special woman out there that is needing some support, go to Anne's website and touch base with her and share her, share this podcast with other mothers so that they can know there is Miss Ann out there, willing to give you support and help you through this transition. Absolutely. I thank you for being here today, for listening again, and I look forward to seeing you next week as well. Have a great week. Joyce Buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of Second Wind. Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com.